If you haven't done so yet, please pause the video and try to answer the question on your own before listening on. Before we want to attack this question, we need to review the electric field that's produced by a ring of charge that is uniformly distributed on that ring. And to understand that, what we can do is consider the following picture where we have a ring of positive charge and we're interested in calculating the electric field at a point P that's hovering above the center of that ring. Now the book goes through a rather complex derivation, but when all is said and done, the electric field, if the ring were composed of positive charges, would be pointing away from point P and it would have the magnitude equal to the following expression. And so here we have that equation for the electric field magnitude produced by a charged ring. And we just want to make sure we understand all the variables in this equation. K is actually a constant that we know is equal to 8.99 times 10 to the ninth. Q, of course, would be the total amount of charge that's present on the ring. Z is the distance from this point P down to the center of the ring. And then R, of course, is the actual radius of the ring. Now, hopefully we can see in the diagram that this picture corresponds nicely to the picture over here, except that we have two charged rings. And the question notes that the smaller ring has a uniform charge distribution whose total charge is equal to positive Q, so perhaps we could label that. And as we just noted, when the ring contains positive charge, then the electric field at this point P is going to point away from the center of that ring. So we can project an electric field vector upward. And in order to get a net electric field of zero at point P, we would have to have an electric field vector of equal magnitude but opposite direction in order to cancel out the electric field that's pointing upward. So we can project an electric field downward and we can label that E prime. And since the electric field would be pointing downward towards the rings, that means that this larger outer ring must bear negative charge because when the ring contains negative charge, the electric field vector points towards that ring of negative charge. So looking at this picture, we can begin to write the following equation. We know that the electric field that's pointing upward has to be equal in magnitude to the electric field that's pointing downward. And then we'll use this expression for the electric fields that, that are present in this equation. So what we'll do is substitute for the red colored electric field this expression, and then we'll do the same thing for the blue electric field. Now we just want to note a couple of things about this equation. The charge that's present on the smaller ring was given to us as positive Q. So we can substitute positive Q in for that charge. For the ring of negative charge, we don't know that charge. That's actually what we're looking for. So we'll just call it Q prime for now. Also, the radii are important. If we look back at the picture, we can see that the radius of the smaller ring was labeled as capital R, and then the radius of the larger ring is R prime. So that means in the equation, we have to fill in R and then R prime, which we have shown right here. However, R prime is equal to three times R. So we're going to substitute three times R in for the R prime. Now we can simplify this equation by essentially dividing both sides by kz. So in essence, the kz's are going to cancel out. Now algebraically, we can't cancel the z that appears on the left and right hand side because it's part of this single term z squared plus r squared to the three halves. So we actually have to come up with an expression for z. We can see from this general picture that z is the distance from the point of interest all the way down to the center. So in our diagram, that distance would be from here all the way down to the center. However, that distance is given to us in the question as being equal to two times the radius. And so we're going to actually set that distance equal to two R. In the equation, that would be our Z value. So we'll go ahead and plug in two R for the Z's. We can simplify each of the denominators just a little bit here. We have 2r, all of which is squared, so that's going to become 4r squared, plus another r squared will be 5r squared. So we'll write 5r squared as the new denominator on the left side, but still raised to the 3 halves. And then on the right-hand side's denominator, we have 2r, all of which is squared, and 3r, all of which is squared. So we're going to have 4r squared plus 9r squared, which will become 13r squared. 
Now, let's go ahead finally and try to solve for q prime. We can actually multiply both sides of the equation by this term so that we essentially move it over to the numerator of the left-hand side. We could then perhaps just rewrite this a little bit so it looks a little tidier. And then this can actually be simplified since both quantities are being raised to the 3 halves power. We can actually write it as follows. And then, of course, if we look carefully, the r squareds will cancel. And then we have what we had sought, the charge Q prime, in terms of the charge that was present on the smaller ring, which was capital Q. We can actually pick up our calculators and simplify this expression here. And when we do that, we get 4.19 times capital Q is equal to the magnitude of charge on the larger ring. Now, don't forget we had concluded that the charge on the larger ring was negative, so we actually need to stick a negative sign in front of this to account for that fact. So this would be the final answer. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, click the thumbs up and subscribe. Send in your own question to the email address on the screen and I'll do my best to answer it on YouTube.